to Romance Studies 202, and it is a great privilege and pleasure to have with me my colleague, Professor Farid Lurusi, who's a professor of French here in the Department of French, Hispanic, Italian Studies at, at UBC. And we're going to talk about Proust, uh, Marcel Proust, or at least the, 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 the beginning of this uh, epic work that he produced, A la Recherche du Tom Perdu. Um, the first volume is Swan's Way, and we're going to talk about the Combre section, which is how, how the, um, the book opens. So thank you, Farid, so much for your time. And I thought my first question would just start by uh, asking you, what makes Proust the figure that he is? I mean, what, what makes this book so important and, and influential? Why Proust? Uh, this is also my pleasure to be part of your of your project. So Proust, yes, it's very important because Proust makes the connection between 19th century literature, French literature, and uh, what we call modernism in the 20th century. So, and Proust never never he never make any secret that uh, he had big influences in 20 in 19th century French novel literature, mainly two figures, uh, Flaubert and Baudelaire, for instance. But what makes Proust big is that he uses his huge references like monuments, Flaubert and Flaubert Aimant and Baudelaire, and then he is going to create his own style, his own writing, he's going to reinvent the novel in different aspects. For instance, um, injecting uh, time or reinventing time in the, in the novel. Um, we can discuss later if you want or the different levels and connections time has in, in this particular novel. Um, he is going, for instance, to uh, use as it was done uh, pretty much at the same time in English literature, the stream of consciousness. Uh, when you have a writer who is pretty much, uh, you are invited, sorry, you are invited in the consciousness of the character, the main character, the narrator, and see the experience from the inside, aesthetic, cognitive, uh, emotional, and so on and so forth. Um, another aspect of the modernity of Proust is uh, technology. How is going to include technology in his writing. And uh, for instance, you have the photograph, cinema, train, cars, airplane, uh, telephone, all these aspects that were pretty much known uh, are going to be part of the, of the novel and play a role as if we were already in what we call our modern days. So that just, that's the very important aspect of, uh, of Proust. Um, do you want me to talk about the, the Narrations well, and fantasy. No. Let, let's talk about these these three things that you've you've just mentioned. Okay, so he he draws on this nineteenth century tradition, Baudelaire, uh, Flaubert, but transforms him. And you mentioned time, a stream of consciousness, um, the relationship with the characters, and uh, technology. Perhaps we could start with with time, the ways in mm -hmm. which um, what what this book, what this again, the opening of this book, what we've read of this book has to say about time and memory and the experience of time. How, mm -hmm. how do you see that? Time, of course, is the, the, the big one, the most important one in that uh, the whole novel, La Recherche du Temps Perdu. Um, how can I say? First, there is one thing that we kind of skip, or maybe it's too obvious that we don't see it in La Recherche, the whole novel, is that there is no chronology. There is no linear time in the novel. There is no, for instance, there is no date more than 3,000 pages, no date. There's only one time he mentions a year, that's in the last volume, Le Temps Retrouvé, Time Regained, when he's, he talks about 1917, when Paris is in the dark because it's being bombed by the German. That's it, that's the only time when you have a date. Then for all the rest, the readers have to be very careful and reconstruct the time. When he talks about a real character, when he died, when he got married, you have to be careful about that, like a detective. But this is huge, 3,000 pages, no time, no, uh, no chronological time, no linear time, nothing. So that's very important. And that's a big distinction from 19th century novel. For instance, if you open the first page of uh, L'Education Sentimentale by Flaubert, the first word is, in 1948, a boat was going down, flowing down, uh, sailing down the, the Seine River, blah, blah, blah. So you have a, a date there. The same for Balzac, the same for Victor Hugo, and so on. Proust, no date, no time. The only thing you have is the time of the day, morning, evening, the seasons, uh, notably with the plants or when the sun sets early or later. That's it. No, nothing, not even the months, nothing. Then, very important, 
it's not just description of time, but the experience of time. And this is truly, truly the signature of Proust. Proust is telling us that we have basically three, three kinds of, we experience three kinds of time. The time in reading, the narrative time, that is dictated by the tenses, present, past, future tenses. You have the time that you experience uh, with, your, with your mind, with your reason. You know that time is passing by. You can tell the difference between yesterday and tomorrow. And then you have eternity. Eternity, that's very important. That's something that we experience without knowing it. And of course, this is exemplified by the experience of the Madeleine, the little French pastry uh, that the character eats. And we know that this is involuntary memory, etc. But what Proust is telling us is not just involuntary memory. He's telling us that the time of the past that was there when the narrator was a kid and eating that little pastry with his aunt, Leonie, that time is still untouched, is still there. You need something to trigger it, and then it will reappear. So this is time out of time. This is very important, and this is new. This is what Proust did. He was a pioneer, if you want, in uh, studying time. So you have um, narrative time, then you have the time we experience with reason, and then you have the one that is more essential, sens sensorial experience with the senses, what you touch, what you see, what you uh, uh, taste, and so on and so forth. So this is really very important. So this makes me think, uh, this is fantastic. So at the very, very beginning, like the opening few pages, we have, we have the narrator in his bed, and there's a sort of uncertainty about where he is and when he is, and, and he had sort of imagines all these previous moments and previous times. And then after the Madeleine scene, um, there's this uh, phrase, I was just looking for it. Oh, here it is. That Combray and all its surroundings, this is the translation, I'm afraid, yes. All of this, which is acquiring form and solidity, emerged town and gardens alike from my cup of tea. And then, and then we get this whole, we're really taken to mm -hmm. this recreation of, 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 a, of a time past, right? Mm -hmm. uh, th thanks to that. Thanks to that moment. Thanks to that scene. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit. And, and I love the way in which you say it's always there. It's always accessible. Um, but you need this chance. In fact, I think he talks about chance. This is a sort of chance encounter uh, with the past. I wonder if you could talk about the way he recreates a space and a time such as Combray, uh, uh, mm -hmm. as he does in the second part of this um, section. First, we need to understand that uh, in search of lost time, la charge temps perdu, is the book about the book being written. It's, I repeat, mm -hmm. this is very important. It's a book yeah. about the book being written. When you start from the beginning, as you just said, longtemps je me suis couché de bonheur, for a long time I went to bed early, which is a very, very beautiful sentence because of the tension between long time and early. And this is one actually one of the shortest sentences in the book. <laughs> this is interesting. This is the narrator, adult, writing about his youth pretending that he's still a young kid going to bed and dreaming and waiting for his mother to come to give him the, the goodnight kiss and so on and so forth. This is the adult writing about that because at the end, in time regain, he realized that he has wasted his life and that the only way to regain time is to be an artist. This is also a very important point in La Rochelle Temps Perdu. Art is what makes you escape um, the constraint of time. That's what he's going to do. To escape time, he's going to become an artist, a writer, and that's what he starts from the beginning. Longtemps, je me suis couché de bonheur, with also a famous a grammar problem with a sentence he used. I mean, when it's in French, you can see. In English, I don't know if you can see it, but in French, there is a grammar problem. So anyway, um, so yes, this is the, the thing about, uh, about, about time, about narration. So this is a book about the book being written. And then what is important is he's going to mix, if you want, the different experiences, okay? So the sensorial time, okay? You see, you taste, you, 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 uh, you hear, and so on and so forth, okay? Then you're going to have the reason time, the time that you can construe with your brain, okay? You can see um, what was uh, important. This one thing that we forget sometimes that makes, that connects with the, the time of reason is a habit. In French, l'habitude. Uh, habit is very important because this is thing that return always in a different way because you have grown up. 
So what you have experienced when you were 10 is not the same as you had 20, 30, 40, 50 experience. The habit is there, but the experience of returning time is not the same. So this is very important. This is something that has been studied actually 40, 50 years after Proust. <laughs> so, uh, and then you have, again, uh, the time of uh, what you call uh, involuntary memory. That's something that he borrowed from his cousin, who was a philosopher uh, named uh, Henry Bergson. Bergson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was a Proust cousin, uh, same family. So he borrowed from him that notion of involuntary time. But for uh, Bergson, involuntary time was some kind of secondary thing. It wasn't very important. We knew that it exists, but not post on the contrary, we say, no, 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 this is very important. Involuntary uh, memory puts us in touch with eternity because this is pure time. Um, and the proof is that we cannot repeat the experience. We cannot repeat the experience. That's what he does with the Madeleine. He takes the first bite, take a second bite, third bite, and then the experience is gone. Um, I had no idea that Bergson was uh, Proust's cousin, the two were cousins. Yes. That's, that's, that's yeah, fascinating. They, they, were, they, were, they were first cousins, not distant, first cousins. Wow. <laughs> so, um, and I, I was really interested in what this um, book had to say about habits as well, right? The, mm -hmm. the sort of habit as repetition, as things that you do without necessarily thinking about them. And then also, but I was also interested in the disruption of habit. Like there's this moment, um, again, I think it's early in the second part, is with the Aunt Leonie. Mm -hmm. And they always, have, they always have dinner at the same time, except Sundays. I think it's Sundays, right? Mm -hmm. And then, then some people forget this, and they're, they're sort of joking about, oh, he, you know, this person forgot it was Sunday. We do things differently on Sunday. So there are also the ways in which the, there are sort of disruptions of habit, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and unexpected things arise and maybe not noticed as such at the time as well, right? And, mm -hmm. and maybe that has something about the memory. In, in retracing these experiences, the, the Proust, the writer, the Proust, the narrator, uh, afterwards writing the book, we come to see things that perhaps we didn't realize at the first time. So, for instance, the so-called lesbian scene, right? Or some of these other discussions that are going on with Swan and so on. But by returning to the same experience, it's different, right? It changes as it gets recounted and retold and, and represented. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could say anything uh, about that. Habit is a very important, plays a very important role in the whole book because it has different graduation, different levels of interpretation. So you're going to have habit in a kind of social caricature. You have a little family, a bourgeois family having that kind of ritual of the dinner every night. And they have the dinner, they have silly conversations, you know, going nowhere, talking about people, gossiping, and so on and so forth. Then Sundays, the meal changes. It's not dinner, it's lunch. It's a soup, very rich bourgeois lunch because in the morning they have church. So different ritual. And then, as you say, they're going to be some kind of sometimes the grain of sense that changes everything because it's unexpected. It breaks the habit. One character in Combray is Le Grandin. Le Grandin, mm -hmm. for instance, appear out of nowhere. They like it, the family, the parents, they like it, but they don't like it. They're not sure yet exactly about Le Grandin because it's kind of pretentious little bourgeois. What is important is that this grain of salt, grain of sand, sorry, of uh, Le Grandin, he's the one who's going to introduce the narrator to literature with Bergotte, the writer. He's the mm -hmm. one who's going to tell him, oh, you want to be a writer? You like to read books? I see that you like to read books. Please read Bergotte. It's going to be enlightening for you. So there's something like uh, serendipity, if you want, with something that breaks the habit. Another, habi another element about habit is, of course, Tante Leonie. Tante Leonie, her life is habit, is yeah. a habit. She has her eau de Vichy, you know, the mineral water. She has a slice of bread. That's it. She doesn't eat much. Uh, and then she spent her time by the window, looking at people, going back and forth, having silly conversation with Francoise. Francoise is like, if you want, like a dog, like a pet for her. Uh, and this kind of comedy, that's why I was talking about, you know, uh, drama earlier. It's like a stage, if you want. So this is the habit that is going nowhere. And this is very important because the element of this habit is boredom. For Leonie, habit is connected to boredom. This is another form of habit. So this is, this is very important, that concept of habit that we miss in the book, which is very important and connects to another layer of time in the novel. 
No, no, that's uh, the, that that's that's great. I, I I love the scenes with Leonie and all this little gossip, right? She's so she she restricts herself to these two rooms basically, mm-hmm. but she's endlessly interested in what what's around her, what she can't see, yeah. which and or she can see glimpses. She can see glimpses, and she wants to hear the full story. And she sends Francoise off to find out more. Just quickly, Leonie is very interesting character also because she helps the narrator develop something that is very important for the whole book, and this is the concept of perspective. Uh-huh. Uh, Leonie, she's in her bed, as you say, and her world has been reduced to one or two bedrooms. That's it. She doesn't even go down to the kitchen. She's upstairs on the, on the second uh, floor in her bedroom. That's it. So she has a limited perspective. The narrator is going to add to this perspective by talking about Leonie, who is talking about the rest of the world. So this is very important to have that uh, aspect of the perspective. And this is another element, not maybe related to time, but related to image and vision and later on to painting. Um, there is a, a painter that comes back over and over in the whole recherche, and it's Vermeer, the, the Dutch painter Vermeer. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and he's one of the inventor of perspective and angle and what you see, what you don't see. So this is very interesting. We are really not going to exhaust everything. There's so much to say. I, I want to finish with one thing. You, you, mm-hmm. We were talking earlier um, about the figure of Swan, who we, we're just beginning to get to know in, in the Combray section. Um, but you had some really interesting things to say about Swan as the, as the hero of, of, the, of, the, of the whole book, of the yes. whole uh, project, mm-hmm. but with a tragic flaw. And I wonder if well, maybe we could finish with that. I thought it was kind of beautiful what you were saying the, mm-hmm. about Swan uh, and how he fits or doesn't fit within the world that Proust is describing. Mm-hmm. He's both part of it and not part of it. Mm-hmm. And yes, how he has this, the, this, this flaw uh, ultimately, which makes him that tragic hero. Yes. Swan is well, Swan is truly the hero in the in, in the Greek sense. He's the one who does not belong to the police, police in the sense of city, the society. Mm-hmm. And at some times he can he can save it because he's rich, he's educated, he's pleasant, too nice, he's friendly. There's nothing nasty about Swan, he's always friendly. Um, he's above the world, he doesn't belong to any particular social class. He knows everybody from the kings. To the, to the maid in the kitchen, he knows everybody. And he's kind of floating in that world, in that world like, as I said, also like a genie in the, in the Arabian nights. So that's, that was one of the influence of Proust's writing. So he's above, he's also become, he's going to become also a model for, uh, for the narrator. The narrator wants to become that kind of elegant man who is very educated and cultivated. But as all heroes in the tragic, in the Greek sense, he has a flaw. And the flow of Swan is love. He does not understand love, and he can be. He cannot be in love, so he's going to be manipulated by this woman. He's going to meet later on with Odette, and Odette is a former prostitute. She's going to use it, abuse it. She's going to cheat on him. He's going to accept everything, and eventually, he's going to develop some kind of pathology that the narrator himself, Marcel, is going to develop also because his model is Swan, and this is jealousy. Jealousy is very important. Jealousy in the novel is, as I said in French, is some kind of the engine of the feeling of love. For the narrator, there cannot be love without jealousy. So this is very important to see that. And we see it by jealousy. We see it, for instance, right from the beginning in the goodnight kiss, when the narrator, the young boy, is right. jealous of his father because the father can have the mother and his, the narrator is just crying for his mother to come and spend the night with him. So already you have the seeds of jealousy there that we're going to see later on in Swan. So Swan is the last hero, if you want, in the kind of long writing uh, literary tradition. Uh, and his flaw is love. He does not understand love and he cannot be in love. So this is fantastic. I, if, if nothing else makes us want to keep on reading, I, th- I think that, that this, this is it, you know, to see how the seeds that are planted in these first 50 and then uh, 150 or so uh, pages will then, um, you know, be harvested or, or, you know, take different shapes mm-hmm. over, the, over the course of the entire project. Mm-hmm. Um, Farid, thank you so much um, for your time and, okay. and your insight and your expertise. Um, this has been great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.